Okay, welcome back. Jeff Dalton from Ask the CMMI Appraiser, and here's Ron Lear. Ron, I see you're smiling already. Yeah, I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> I bet you do. Your uh, wife getting tired of hearing about it? or? No, you know, she's a good litmus test. I'll say, what do you think about this? Just, you know, give me a standard, plain Jane, like, you know, run-on-the-mill answer. She's actually getting it. I've actually been getting feedback from people saying, I actually am starting to understand what it is you guys do now. <laughs> I'm still trying to explain to my mother what I do. It's easier just to say I do computer stuff. Yeah, or you could you could fall back on that '70s show and just I'm going to just tell them you're a farmer, right? <laughs> well, well, Ron, it's great to have you here, and I know you guys are super busy. And you got a lot of stuff. I just noticed there's a new product even being announced this week over there. Yeah, we just announced the Cyber Maturity Platform this week, and it's being announced at the RSA conference this week. So we're pretty excited about that. We had two major launches in about two and a half weeks. You guys remind me of that plate spinning guy from the Lawrence Welk show. Do you remember that? That is exactly what it feels like, too. Let me tell you. That's exactly what it feels like. You need a band over there to play to. Well, we almost have the makings of that. We could have you come in, join us on bass. We've got Joe who can play guitar and stuff. I mean, we've got the makings of a band for sure. Excellent. Well, good. Well, I wanted to ask you about something that's near and dear to my heart. As you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, out in the community talking about the generic practices over the years. And I call them the MVPs, the most valuable practices. Um, the other term, I sometimes call them the secret sauce of the model. And when 2.0 came out, I noticed they weren't there anymore. So tell us what's going on with that. So it's funny because you and I think a lot alike on some of this stuff, Jeff. And one of the things that I used to tell my customers is, hey, now that you've had an intro course, can you pick out one practice in the model or one area in the model that actually could address the entire model for you? And I always point them to GP 2.2 because yep. it's got the whole list of all of them right exactly there. So right. if you create a plan to implement this, you've done it. So where did we solve that? And where did we keep that? Well, we've solved it and kept it in II and Go. So implementation infrastructure and governance. And what we've done there is a couple of things. One is we believe we've removed, and the reason I say we believe is because we piloted this several times, um, and we're actually still piloting it with our MDAP program. We've removed the, I'll say, checkbox mentality that a lot of people fell into, not purposely or anything else, but they just fell into it saying, yep, got a policy, yep, got a plan, yes, got CM, yes, got this. And it, they weren't really looking and saying, do I need that? Is it adding value to what I'm doing? So back mm -hmm. to value statements and performance. Um, we we kept what was important around things like ensuring that you had senior management oversight, uh, making sure that you were measuring things, that you had good process definition in place. All the key pieces and elements of the generic practices are still there. And what we've done, I think it's a kind of an elegant twist. So a lot of people were looking at this and say, let's apply the GPs to every one of those practice areas or the process areas in 1.3. So you start doing the math, 22 practice process areas at level three. 200 plus practices, yeah. Right, so we've actually achieved, and a lot of this came from the reduction in the generic practices, about a 65% reduction in the overall volume of the model alone, and still kept that secret sauce. So the stuff that's in II, the stuff that's in Gov, really hits all those same points. And then the little subtle twist we've done is, don't apply them to practice areas, because remember, you don't implement the model. You don't implement practice areas. They're right. not implementable processes. You look at your processes against II and Gov and see how II and Gov is being met there. So we've also defined this thing called a process role now to say, hey, I'm the configuration management guy. My role is to perform configuration management. If I'm supporting four projects, those four projects need to involve me in that role because I'm doing that role for them. II and Gov ties directly into that because then you can say, do you have resources for someone to perform that role? Do you have senior management support to perform that role, et cetera? So I think it's a nice, elegant rebundling um, and revisioning of the generic practices. Um, we're hearing pretty positive results on the pilots. Right. Our MDAP program with the FDA, they're seeing a real benefit out of this. Um, we, when a couple of the projects went through this before, they looked at the generic practices and they sort of said, gee, this seems a little overkill. We do this in one place. A lot of them had ISO quality management systems in place. So they would go, I've already got it all covered there. And you're telling me I have to do it 12 times? Like, no, you got to just do it once and here's how it works. 
So there's actually a much more elegant fit in terms of how businesses are actually operating there. So I think it's a really nice addition. It kept all the really great stuff about the generic practices and hopefully cut out a lot of the, I'll say, process fat to, to really focus it down to the right stuff. That's great. Uh, you know, one of the things that we have to do in this business, both you and I, is, is dispel myths, right? Right. And, uh, it would be great if we could all say, here's a great new product. Let's all go have fun with it. But sometimes we just have to dispel the myths or the, I guess today we'd call that fake news, right? About right. The MMI. And two things I've been hearing, maybe you can help us dispel. I think we're on the same page. And you just mentioned one of them is this, this notion of roles. So the way it looks is that I got to have roles and I got to have people dedicated to those roles. But that's not really true, is it? I can have people wear many role hats, right? That's correct. And, and you have to take a look at it from the perspective of the process. So the process could be I'm performing the role as CM here. But over on this project, I might be performing a role as QA or the M&A guy or whatever. So the process is what defines it, right? So what we tried to do with 2.0 is get it out of the, I'll say, abstractness of the model and put it into the real situation in the business and say, what's your process needs and what are the roles in those processes? And then knock yourself out. If you can do it with four people or one people or whatever, knock yourself out. So, so clarify for agile teams who traditionally don't assign roles. They traditionally pick up whatever needs to be done and gets it done within the two-week sprint. They may not have a configuration management role to find or a QA role to find. How would they deal with it? So again, any agile team is going to, as they're planning their sprint, they're going to be looking at the story points and the so forth that they put in there. I would treat these, when we've done this on the pilots, I treated those as part of the story points, saying yeah. this is something you got to burn down. Right. So, if you don't get to it in this sprint, then okay. And hey, I might pull risk in to look and say, if I don't get it now, what's going to happen to me in the downstream and the sprints and so forth. That'd be one way that I would do it. Just have it as part of the regular, you know, rhythm of the agile framework. Yeah, I think we're aligned on that. One of the things I hear from a lot of agile teams is, well, those things don't add value and story points should just have value. And then there's some education there, right? Those things do add value. They just aren't thinking of it in the way we are. Right. So um, one of the keynote speakers coming up at the conference in two weeks is Jim Thompson. He's the uh, Undersecretary of Defense for major program support, including things like the Joint Strike Fighter. I had a long conversation with him. Um, we're going to actually do a panel discussion as part of his keynote. And he kept talking about making software boring again. And he wants a software <laughs> factory like he has aircraft factories or bomb making factories because that's boring. It's easy. You know what's going in, you know what comes out, but he doesn't get that from software. And he goes, I said, so Jim, why is that a problem? He goes, well, right now the biggest push is in Agile. And what happens is the Agile teams get stuff done faster, but they lost the discipline that came along with from before. He goes, I want the discipline back. So he and I were kidding around. I said, you know, I love to poke some of the Agile guys a little bit and say, you do know that Agile is just a little waterfall, right? If you do it right. And then I always get a chuckle out of that. But he was actually on board with that, that the model coupled with Agile is a really, really solid way to develop software. Yeah, there's definitely a movement out there right now to bring more discipline to agility. So maybe you guys will, uh, will find a nexus there. That's what we're hoping for. Yeah, there's one more thing, Ron, I wanted to ask you about before we're done. Um, I had an interesting call the other day. I've actually had two of them, and I've heard this from other partners, that people are calling and saying, hey, there were 356 practices in level two before, and now there's 182, and maturity level three, I'm talking about level three now, uh, in version two, it should only take us half as long and cost half as much. What do you think about that? So that's, there's, I'll say there is an element of truth to that. Um, part of one of the major goals of 2.0 was to reduce the footprint of the model and still keep its value. Mm -hmm. So we reduced the footprint of the appraisal process, that's for sure. We saw right. that all in the pilot. Um, you can all go out to the website right now. If you download the, C the China Merchants Bank um, pilot, you'll see some really amazing results there. Um, but also, the model itself is easier and cheaper to implement, to deploy, and to adopt. So from that perspective, I wouldn't go as far as saying cut it in half or anything like that. That's going to be dependent on the deployment, how big a broad sure. you go. Um, but we have been seeing in all the pilots that it is cheaper. The more you can customize the model, you can fit it to yourself. What if you don't care about maturity level three? Maybe you want capability level three, four, five, and whatever else, and a handful of PAs, and that's all your business is. 
you can do that now in a much more simple and elegant way. So that definitely is a Lego. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Ron. I appreciate you meeting with us today and clarifying some of these informations. We're going to call you the CMMI Mythbuster. I'm, I'm all in. I'm going to get t-shirts made. We ought to do a series, a uh, television series called Mythbusters and have you be the face of that. Hey, I'm all in. That sounds good. Sounds like a topic for the workshop, even. All right. Thanks a lot, Ron. Appreciate you having, having you on. Thanks very much, Jeff. Thanks. Bye.